Briar Elementary and High is a small school of just under 300 students, from first grade all the way to senior year. It's spaced between two buildings and has been running since the early 1900s, although it was just a high school academy back then. And apparently there's a monster in there now. It's just little things that leads people to believe there's something supernatural lurking in the halls. The things that would go missing, only to turn up later caked in muddy fingerprints. The food theft, mostly lunch boxes, but sometimes whole pizzas would just vanish into thin air. Hearing something crawling under the floor, and the hissing you can sometimes hear while in the girls' bathroom in the high school. If you go in there alone, sometimes you'll make out whispers. There's three rumors about what it really is. I'll go over each one. One. There's a creep who lives in one of the nearby caves and invades the school to get memories to jerk off to later, and supplies. Around the Briar School area there are a lot of caves and tunnels that go underground. Kids have wandered in there and never come out. One of them's beneath the school actually, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Now, supposedly, there's a man by the name of Dale Horton who lives in these caves. Dale was a pedophile who preyed on little girls, inviting them to his house to model for him before he'd rape them and slash their throats, draining their blood so he could drink it later. He even shaved their heads. He liked how their hair felt. Dale was caught and sentenced to life in prison, but on his way to permanent lockup, he broke free and hid in the cave system. They never caught him. However, I'm gonna have to break your hearts on this one. There is no Dale Horton. Dale Horton never existed. Seriously, I looked it up. No serial murder pedo either. The closest I can find to this sort of crime is a serial rapist that attacked three teenage girls before being caught. He was a fellow student by the name of Kyle. I think he managed to shake the charges off, though I never found evidence of an official case being brought against him. Uh, that's life when you're a boy with a promising future and a sports scholarship. 2. It's the ghost of a teacher killed by a spurned lover. This legend's literally as old as the school. There was this woman, Miss Agnes Cherry, who taught the freshman music, beloved by all, always pleasant to have around, and of course, had many admirers among the staff and students. One student in particular was downright obsessed with Miss Cherry. So much, in fact, he got her alone and begged her to run away with him so they could get married. Agnes told him to go away and that his actions were inappropriate. In response, he took out a knife and slashed her throat, dragged her out of the school into the mud before he killed himself. That's why everything's covered in mud when she touches it. People have even seen Agnes's ghost, a pale woman covered in mud and always sounding like she's gasping for air. Okay. Agnes was actually real, so was her admirer. Her throat was slashed too. But she didn't die. Nope. She actually survived the attack and went on to marry the principal. Her daughter teaches at the school, Ms. Patton. She's in charge of the creative writing class. I'm 90% sure she made up the rumor that Agnes died just to get a kick out of the student's stories. There's one more. The one that has the least amount of detail. It's another ghost story, about a girl who used to go to this school. Feeling like she was ugly and had no one to love her, she broke a mirror and cut her throat in the girl's bathroom, effectively ending her life. This one doesn't explain the mud though, and doesn't even try to say who she was as it's clear bullshit. There's never been a suicide on grounds. But I knew her name, and I knew what really happened. Samantha Bishop. That was her name. She was a sophomore. Her favorite color was teal. She liked pearl earrings. Her favorite food was lasagna. She loved Garfield, even had pajamas with his face on it. Avril Lavigne was her hero. She was saving her money to one day go to one of her concerts. But she also was socially awkward and suffered from a lack of self-esteem due to her glasses prescription giving her the appearance of having enormous, buggy eyes. This just made her a target for people who didn't bother to look past the book's cover. One girl in particular and her friends 
Audra Hart, Candace Whitfield, and Cindy Sweet. Audra was the ringleader. She used her nail polish to write nasty messages on Samantha's locker, knocked her things from her hands, would constantly talk shit about her right while she was in the room. One time when she was on her period, Samantha bled through during class, and when Audra saw the red stain on the back of Samantha's pants, she screamed out loud about how filthy Samantha was. Filthy Sam. By the end of the day, everyone was calling her Filthy Sam. The tormenting just got worse. Her mother tried to stop it. Oh, she did. But Audra's father was a major figure on the school board and donated yearly to the sports program, so Audra got away with every damn thing. But of course came the day things got taken too far. Typically just before lunchtime, Samantha would go into the bathroom to just get away from the bullies from a few moments. And typically said bullies would be too focused on getting something to eat, rather than chasing down filthy Sam. But this time Audra had to go to the bathroom. And when she saw Samantha, she couldn't resist the chance to pick on her again. It started off simple. The name calling. Filthy Sam. Bug Eyes. Alien. Freak. When Samantha ignored her, likely advice from the staff, Audra started to get meaner. Made cuts about her mom being a slut, her retarded little sister. So stupid she can't even make it into kindergarten, huh? That was too far. Samantha loved her family. Her hard-working mom who divorced and remarried. Her little sister who schooled from home due to Asperger's. It was too much. So Samantha turned around and slapped Audra across the face. A much overdue slap, if you ask me. But Audra reacted back much harsher. She grabbed Samantha by the hair and slammed her face into the mirror, shattering it with the force. Samantha dropped from the floor and stopped breathing. The girls panicked that they may have accidentally murdered their prey, remembered that in this particular bathroom, there was a crawl space in the floor where they kept the cleaning supplies. They opened it up, and with a heave, Ho shoved Samantha's lifeless body into the crawl space. They slammed it shut, cleaned the blood off the mirror, and went about their day like nothing ever happened. Cindy ever so kindly reported to the teachers that the mirror was broken. They plotted to return after school and somehow smuggle Samantha's body out in an instrument case before dumping the body wherever they could. See, now we're getting to the part about the caves and the fact one of those tunnels happens to be right beneath the school. When the girls returned and opened up the crawl space, they found a hole that plummeted straight down to a bottomless pit. Perhaps throwing Samantha in there so roughly had broken the floor. Maybe it just couldn't support the weight of a teenage girl. Either way, Samantha was gone. Assuming she was dead, the girls made a pact that they'd never tell anyone, boyfriends, husbands, teachers, or parents, that they'd killed Samantha. Life went on. Samantha made the news when she turned out to be gone. Audra was questioned but let go. They had no proof she had anything to do with Samantha's disappearance. Soon her locker was emptied out. Her desk remained empty. Audra and her friends graduated, went to college, got jobs with the influence of their families, married rich. And no one knows about their dirty little secret of murder. Samantha's mother became depressed but kept it together for the youngest child of hers. Another daughter by the name Patricia. Patty for short. Patty grew up with all the love of her mother and stepdad. She found her love in poetry and writing, creating scripts for comics by the time she was 12, and she ended up going to Briar Elementary her sixth grade year. Despite her social difficulties at first, Patty found a group she could blossom with. Bullies were laughed at in their faces. Patty never really understood their insults anyway. Where Samantha lacked self-esteem, Patty almost had more than her fair share. She found herself to be different from others, sometimes in ways that confused or angered them, but she was still worthy of respect. 
Her skills in writing blew away her teachers, and she was moved up several classes in order to keep her challenged. She won contests. She was the president of the writing club by her eighth grade year. I've always found communication tricky, by the way. It's so much easier to just write the words out. Sometimes I've had to have accommodations made for me, given my sensitivity to sound and difficulty eating in front of others, but rather than bother them each time I ate in the bathroom. And it was that bathroom where I found my sister again. I heard the rasping breaths below the floor, and although I'd heard rumors of ghosts and pedophiles, I didn't believe in them. And rather than run away, I opened up the crawl space. She dropped away so fast I could barely make her out, but I caught a flash of her pearl earrings. That night I went to the school, more accurately, under the school. It was tricky finding the right cave, but I took my time, mapped myself through it, and soon I was under the school. And I found where Samantha Bishop had been all these years. I wouldn't go as far as to say she's become primal, but after receiving the head injuries and being completely isolated for so long, I think it's safe to say she's lost her mind. She's several pounds underweight from a strict diet of rats, toads, and rainwater, has torn out most of her hair, and is now completely blind from living in near total darkness. She knows it's me, though. She knows my voice, my scent. She knows I'm her sister. I haven't attempted to force her out from her squalor. I can barely get near her without her darting away deeper into the caves. She had moments of clarity where she's told me what happened, but most of her vocalizations are hums and clicks of her tongue, similar to the croaking of the toads. I have helped her though, brought her blankets, clothes. Her uniform was nothing more than rags at this point brought her lasagna and other healthier food in attempts to give her more strength. I don't know what to do though anymore. Should I tell the police and force her from this nightmare she's been living in into a whole new one? Make her re-enter a society that tried to kill her? Besides, I can't explain away the fact that Cindy and Candace were found dead in their homes. Their ribs gnawed on, innards ripped out, and their throats cut with the glass shards of mirrors and I almost wish Audra hadn't moved out of town. It's going to be hard to hide Samantha so long in the back seat of my car. The room was depressingly quiet. I had reserved 12 tables for the reunion and 12 tables sat empty. I wanted to laugh, scream, and cry. For weeks, I'd worked out the particulars of this event and even spent a good deal of money to travel back from Europe, just to be stood up by everyone. Can I bring you something, sir? Asked a waitress as she stepped up beside me, tugging anxiously at the bow tie beneath her chin. I looked at the woman, maintaining a feigned look of indifference. Maybe just a glass of water, I decided. The waitress nodded, a look of pity shifting through her eyes before she turned away, and she headed off towards the kitchen. I sighed and turned back to set my eyes on the white tablecloth and the empty dish that sat in front of me. Similarly, empty dishes circled the round table. My phone sat beside the folded napkin, and I brushed my thumb over the screen, lighting it for the eighth time in 15 minutes. Still no notifications. I'd sent out several emails to the group and not one of my ex-classmates had responded. Bored, I entertained a whim. Let's see what these assholes are actually up to. I breathed to myself quietly as I lifted the device. I pulled up a social media app that had sat in an unused folder on my phone and opened it. I thought for a moment, trying to remember my old password and successfully logged in on the second try. Gage Borwick, I mumbled as I typed his name into a search bar. He was the first person to contact me back when I reached out to plan this reunion. His profile popped up and I pressed my thumb to his highlighted name. 
I waited patiently for it to load, but as the page came up I immediately furrowed my brow. The account had been memorialized with a page full of misuse from family and friends and prayers and condolences from acquaintances. Gage was dead, and looking at the dates of the posts he had been for at least two years. It didn't make any sense. I switched back to my email and looked through the string of messages between myself and my ex-classmates. Sure enough, there he was, Gage Borwick 03, saying that he was happy to hear from me and was excited to get together with everyone for the first time since the last reunion. The one I'd missed since I was overseas. A knot formed in my stomach and I swallowed harshly. I looked over the other names in the group emails and then, almost frantically, navigated back to the social media app. I searched for another name. Alice Kennedy, memorialized, killed in a mugging four years ago. Jake Telly, memorialized, killed in an accident at work six months ago. Wendy Grayshaw, memorialized, killed during a convenience store holdup seven years ago. My heart pounded in my chest, and I left the spelling of names more to autocorrect than the dexterity of my shaking fingers. Olivia, Memorialized. Brian. Memorialized. Alexander. Memorialized. Paige. Memorialized. Everybody. Everyone was dead, murdered or killed in strange, often unexplained accidents. Everybody but me. The phone slipped from my quivering grasp, landing on my silverware and sending a sharp ring through the room before bouncing to the floor. I felt like I was gasping for breath as my mind raced. Who had I been messaging back and forth with? Who had sent me emails agreeing to attend the reunion from the accounts of my deceased classmates? Who would? Who could even do that? My throat was dry. I wanted water. I had asked the waitress for some. Remembering that, I looked over towards the doorway the woman had left through. Someone else was standing there. They were dressed in all black baggy clothing that hid their body shape and had a hood pulled up around their heads. A black veil, impossible to see through, concealed their face. I stood from my seat, knocking the chair over as I felt a sense of dread grip me, and every instinct within me screamed, Danger! I kept my eyes on the stranger as I backed away, trying to remember exactly where the exits were so I could line up for them when I built up the nerve to turn and run. The front entrance was too far away, but there had been a set of double doors on the side of the room. I wasn't sure where they led, but I could at least get a barrier between me and the stranger. I glanced over my shoulder to get a glimpse of my escape route, and in that moment, there was a flutter of movement. The hooded figure was fast, and their footsteps made almost no sound. The distance closed between us quickly, and I turned to run as I let out a shriek of desperation. I reached the set of double doors and hit them with my shoulder, but to my dismay, they held fast in place, and I bounced back from the impact. They were locked. Heat. Heat like warm water from a shower head spread through my body, originating from the small of my back. Then it hurt. I tried to move, but rather than taking a step, my legs just collapsed underneath me, and I crumpled to the floor, landing on my back. The hooded figure stood above me, a knife in their hand glinted red with blood. My blood. The figure crouched down, bringing their veiled face close to mine. They regarded me patiently and then spoke in a quiet whisper. I was wondering who I'd forgotten. Of course it would be you, David. I can't believe it slipped my mind that you'd gone overseas this time. I gritted my teeth against the searing pain that continued to rise in me, lancing out from the wound at the base of my spine, but I managed to speak. This time? I asked, my voice a strained hiss. Congratulations, David. You've won this round. Well, technically, I've won this round, but I always win. Coming in second does have its benefits, though. I didn't understand what they were saying. Why? 
was all I could muster. Plenty of reasons, they whispered. But you'll have some time to figure them out. Since you were the last one left, you get to keep your memories. You're insane. Please stop. Help me. I don't want to die. I gasped. The hooded figure shook their head. No, not after I spent all that time looking for you. Now it's your turn to look for me and try to stop me if you can. You get one hint? I too was one of your classmates. Then the figure laughed a breathy laugh through their nose. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't place their voice. I couldn't even tell if they were a man or a woman. They raised the knife holding the point above my face. The knife slid into my eye and for a split second I knew nothing but excruciating pain and then my alarm was going off. I sat up from my bed screaming, hands shooting to clutch at my face as I frantically gasped for air. I was breathing. I was alive. I was okay, I realized. I let out a long, shaky breath and cursed my vivid imagination. I hadn't had a dream like that in years, and I hoped my old nightmares weren't returning. My alarm continued to buzz and I felt a moment of confusion. What day was it? Was the reunion tonight then? Wasn't it a weekend? Why was my alarm going off so early? It definitely wasn't 3 p.m. yet. I pulled my hands away from my face and looked to the left of my bed, where my alarm clock should have been on my bedside table. Instead, I saw a wall. Confused and groggy, I looked to my right. There beside me was a bedside table that wasn't mine, and on it was an alarm clock that wasn't mine. I blinked a few times and then recognized them, but I hadn't had them for years now, about a decade to be exact. I rubbed my eyes and looked around the room. My room. The room I'd had in high school. A moment of panic gripped me, casting away the last of my sleepiness, and I realized that aside from being back in my parents' house, I should have been in a hotel room anyway. I threw the covers away and pushed myself out of bed only to lose my balance and catch the wall for support. My body felt different, familiar but different. I stumbled out of my bedroom and across the hall into the bathroom, flicking on the light as I did. In the mirror, I saw myself. Me, high school me, I screamed. Loud and without reserve, I screamed, and moments later I heard the door to my parents' room burst open, and my mother dashed out to find me in the bathroom. I gasped as her arms wrapped around me. David, David, it's okay. You're okay, it was a dream, just another dream. She assured me. I could see her face in the mirror, looking so much younger than she had the last time I'd seen her. The implications of that only terrified me even more. I'd stopped screaming but was shaking and quivering. The other nightmares I used to have started to come back to me, the night terrors that left me helplessly afraid upon waking. Blood. I always saw blood and a gun, a knife, or a bat. Sometimes a truck or a train. Sometimes I didn't know what it was, but always something hurt me or killed me. And always there was that veiled face and that whispery voice. How many times have I been killed? I wondered to myself with a quiet sob. How many times have we all been killed? My mother consoled me. Shh, nobody's been killed. You're okay, you're just stressed. Tomorrow's your first day of high school, so it's normal to have bad dreams. It's perfectly normal. In the past, that would have comforted me and helped calm me down. But this time I knew the truth. They weren't dreams. They were memories. I would have left if it were not for financial matters, I just can't support myself without this job. Being 24 years old and two years fresh out of university, you can't blame me for staying with the opportunity. I am given remarkable benefits. The work is light and most of the work occurs in the broad of day. Students chatting, teachers teaching. Everything is so alive better than my previous office job where the constant sounds of printing paper falling into the tray would kill my sanity. 
Janitorial work is wonderful. I mean, what more could you ask for from this line of work? But it's the after hours that really get to me. The dark, dreary hallways always give off a negative energy, and the pitch black classrooms feel habited as if something sinister lurks in the darkest corners of the facility. I feel like my high school is home to evil presences, and I need to share my stories out there. You're the only ones who will listen. I did not want to end up fired or worse, thrown into an asylum. I particularly remember this one occurrence because it was my first time experiencing something that logic could not explain. Typically, when all the students are in class, I tend to clean everything thrice. I decided to clean out the male's washroom because I was honestly bored out of my mind. It was my second time cleaning it out this hour. I specifically remember my mother saying, always clear the washroom of people before you go in. I knew what she implied. As regular routine, I knocked on the rusted door of the restroom and called out my intentions. One of the toilets flushed, followed by the rigorous roars of the hand dryer. I waited what seemed to be five minutes before I cracked open the door and asked if everything was all right. The students are known to intake illegal substances. It would not be the first time had I stumbled across an intoxicated student. I could hear the echoes of the principal's high heels as she circled the now empty hallways. I did not want her to see her janitor just standing around, so I decided to head inside. My heart sank to my stomach when I cleared the stalls. How could I have heard the toilet flush if no one was even in the washroom? I checked every stall twice before I walked out, not terrified, but uncomfortable. Don't get me wrong, this school is not all that bad. We are known to have the highest grade point average in the province among all grades. The school hosts many events which the students take part in. I've been to all of them because, well, I had to clean up after. It was nearing the end of the school year, and the seniors decided to skip school because it was annual senior skip day. I always assumed they went to the beach. You would not imagine how empty the halls were that day, and how silent the grade 12 students' classrooms were. This is one of the most chilling stories that I keep incognito because I just can't explain it. I know a lot of students that pass by the halls. Most students ignore me. Some wave, some smile. The ones who willingly strike conversations with me are the best. They definitely make my day better. Thomas Berkeley was his name. He was a popular jock, unbelievably smart, and actually saw me as a person instead of a waste man. In hindsight, he was going far in life. When I caught a glimpse of him walking into a classroom on senior skip day, I knew something was off. I did not know him too well, so I went forward to clean whatever the hell I was cleaning at the time. I got the call three hours later that Thomas was stabbed 14 times to death in the parking lot and dumped into the trash bin. It's always sad to hear these stories, but this one hit really home. His family, his reputation, his future all ruined within a minute. They never caught the man but they had video surveillance of a long, dark figure running away after it grotesquely mutilated the 18-year-old. When the police arrived to the scene, he had been pronounced dead 10 hours prior, 6.44 a.m. I saw Thomas in the flesh eight hours after this incident, but police say that he hadn't even stepped into the building. Police also say that a strange symbol was carved into Thomas's chest, which may be a lead to catch the perpetrator. Something tells me that this may have a darker history than meets the eye. Does anyone know anything about what is going on? I don't want to disclose my location for obvious reasons, but I do need insight. I am writing this now because the other janitor called in sick and I am ordered to clean up the basement. I never do it alone, but when I do, unexplainable things happen. I may write them down later in a series. The tone of the school fades when you're the only one in the building.